Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. I'm Heather with Sioux College, and I am very happy to welcome all of you and to welcome Elizabeth and Mary from the Long Mangle G Law Firm. Um, we're very fortunate to have them today to speak to you about your permits, uh, about your plans, transitioning maybe from study to work, and some potential opportunities to keep in mind if you're considering permanent residence as a future option in Canada. Um, so I'll pass it over to them. Just a few points. Please put your questions into the question and answer box um, so that there'll be a question and answer period toward the end of the session. And we'll hopefully be able to answer the vast majority of questions. But I do ask that you please listen because I think the presentation really is designed to answer your questions. So Elizabeth, Mary, I'll pass it to you. Thank you so much, Heather. It's great to be here as always, guys. You know, we're really uh, in interesting times uh, these days. Uh, there are, there were last year, there was just a record number of international students who've come to Canada. And um, the government is talking about capping the numbers of immigrant, uh, of international students. And, you know, this year for permanent residents, we will have, and the economic streams, we will have around 200, I think 220 or 240,000 uh, spots under the economic streams, which may not be that much considering we have around 700,000 international workers and around 900,000 international students as well. So today what we're going to do is we're gonna talk about what you guys need to know um, as temporary residents first, then we're going to talk about permanent residence as well for you guys. Uh, but just keep in mind, laws are always changing for immigration, and especially laws for international students will likely change throughout this year. Um, and after we, what we tell you today is true today, but after this recording, um, and everything is going to be recorded, we'll send it to you guys as well. But after today, uh, laws can change. We will be putting whoever has registered uh, on the uh, for this webinar. We'll, we will be putting you guys on our newsletter. Um, we have also now this year started doing TikTok videos and Instagram and Facebook videos. Um, it's just a lot faster for us to also tell you about some of the news. And sometimes videos are easier to explain the newsletters as well. So please feel free. Uh, to follow us on all of those things as well. Okay. All right. Let's get started here. All right. So first thing, let's talk about temporary residents. So uh, you're here, you're studying. What do you need to know about your current status? First thing you need to understand is just because you have a study permit that is valid until a certain date, it doesn't mean that you just have status uh, on on uncertain uh, no uncertain terms. Just you know, based on the fact that you have a study permit, your status as an international student is based on the fact that you are actively pursuing your studies. If you stop pursuing your studies, actively pursuing your studies you will lose your status after 90 days, okay? So what is actively pursuing your studies? It means you're enrolled as a student and you're uh, you know, going to class and et cetera. Now, um, if you, uh, there are two exceptions to the rule uh, for being enrolled as a student and going to classes. One is scheduled breaks, you know, if everybody has a break that is listed on the academic calendar, that's a scheduled break, you're fine with that. Also, um, if you are an individual who at some point is having some difficulty having uh, being able to study on a full-time basis, uh, then what you can do is go to the school first. Don't just take it on your own and say, okay, I'm going to leave. You can't do that. You have to go to the school first and say, uh, I have an issue, you know, uh, maybe it's your health, maybe it's finances, maybe whatever it is, you can ask the school to give you authorized leave. And that's up to 150 days. Okay. And then 
if the school says yes, you can take that time off. You can take that one semester off, okay? And that you will still be considered to actively pursue studies. You won't lose your status. But keep in mind, when you have authorized leave, you're taking the entire semester off, you are not able to work at all because you're not then enrolled as a full-time student. Not part-time, not full-time, not at all when you are on authorized leave, okay? So let's talk about working while you're studying, okay? You can work only when you are a full-time student, except in the last semester. Last semester, you're allowed to be a part-time student and still work, but otherwise you can only work as a full-time student. Once you've stopped, you once you've completed your studies, you are no longer a student. You have to stop working. When the school tells you, you have completed your program, that is the first indication you have to stop working right away. Okay, you cannot work anymore after that. The only exception is if you've completed one program and then you have registered for another program that is you know, only once less or one semester away. So let's say you completed your program in April and then, you know, you sign up for another program in September. In between that time, as long as you're already registered and been accepted for the new program, then you can work in between these programs. Okay. So another important thing to note is to always make sure that you maintain your status while you're here in Canada. So the first thing that you need to do right now is pull out your study permit and look at the date that's listed on, as the expiry date. Write it down in your calendar, put it in your phone, put it somewhere that you're going to remember because you need to pay attention to when your study permit expires. If your study permit is going to expire, for example, before you finish your program, you need to make sure that you apply to extend your permit before that expiry date. And another key thing to understand in all of this is implied status. So when you submit an extension for your study permit, as long as you submit it properly and before the expiry date that's listed on your permit, you'll hold what's called implied or maintained status while you're waiting for a decision on that application. So as long as you apply for the extension before your expiry date, you can continue studying in Canada while you're waiting for IRCC to give you a decision or process your application. The one important thing about implied status, so if you've applied for that extension and you're waiting for a decision, it does require that you, you do need to be in Canada while you wait for a decision on your new application. Otherwise, if you leave Canada while you're on implied status, your implied status will end. And then another thing to understand is restoration. So let's say you wake up one day and you realize, oops, I totally missed the expiry date on my study permit. Well, you might still be in what's called the restoration period. So from the expiry date on your permit, you have 90 days to apply to restore your status. So if you've lost your status, you can apply to get your status back by submitting what's called a restoration application. And it's really important to keep in mind that the deadlines on restoration are very strict. So you have 90 days from when you lose your status to apply for restoration. So that means if you've passed the expiry on your study permit, or if you've applied for an extension and it was refused, keep in mind you have that 90 day period to apply to restore your status. And just to clarify, so if your study permit has expired, you have 90 days from the date that's listed on your permit as your expiry date. And if you have applied for an extension and it gets refused, you have 90 days from the date on the refusal letter to submit a restoration application. All right. So post-grad work permits. So let's say you've almost finished your program. Congratulations, you're almost there. What do you do then? Uh, the first question that you should keep in mind is not how do I apply for the post-grad work permit, is should I apply for the post-grad work permit? Because you can only get one post-grad work permit in your lifetime, okay? As a result, if you don't have enough time on your post-grad work permit, so how much time do you have on your post-grad work permit? It depends on your program. If 
your program is one year, for example, you only get a one year work permit. If it's a two year program, you get a three year work permit. Sometimes people who get a one year work permit, you might not have enough time to get the work experience or job offer that you need in order to have a good chance to get permanent residence. Now, if you only have a one-year program and you don't apply for a post-grad work permit and you applied for, an, and then you did another program afterwards, you could get a three-year work permit if you did two one plus one programs, okay? So in those situations, um, that's something that uh, is very important, right? So if, before you actually say, okay, I'm just gonna go and apply for post-grad work permit, you should, at that point, you can, you know, meet with us or another lawyer who can give you a good background and a good plan on how you're going to get permanent residence, okay? Because you can only qualify for one post-grad work permit in your life. Um, the other thing that you need to keep in mind is what you need to know or do in order to qualify for the post-grad work permit, right? So... Distance education, for example, it has to be less than 50% of your program. So any sort of online program that you do, it should be less than 50% of your program. Also, very important, you have to have been a full-time student in every semester of your program except the last semester, okay? Sometimes I have people who come to me and say, Elizabeth, I'm going to fail my courses. Uh, I don't know what to do, you know, or maybe I have some issues. So one of the things is you can take an entire semester off with authorized leave. If you get permission from the school to take the entire semester off, take this entire semester off. Much, much better than doing it part time. OK, if you take the entire semester off with authorized leave, you go back and become a full time student again. That's OK. The other thing is, even if you were to fail your courses, but you sat for your final exams, you did not drop any courses, okay? Then you're still a full-time student. And then if you had to redo those courses afterwards, as long as you maintain full-time student status every semester, except the last semester, where you can make up those courses and be a part-time student in the last semester, then you would still qualify for the post-grad work permit. Otherwise, if you go part-time in one of these semesters, you jeopardize your ability to get a post-grad work permit, and you may need to do a whole new program in order to qualify for the post-grad work permit. Now, when should you apply for your post-grad work permit? You should apply for your post-grad work permit. I'm going to tell you the deadline should be within 90 days of your completion of your program or if your study permit is still valid and it expires before the 90 days, you have to apply when your study permit is still valid. If you were to do that, you can start working right away when you apply. The website does say that you can, IRCC websites does say you can apply within 180 days. But if you apply after the 90 days, you don't have student status anymore, and you're not able to work after the 90 days while you're waiting for your work permit, okay? So here's the timeline again, okay? So let's say, you know, you are writing your final exams, okay? You're a full-time student, so you can work at that point, okay? Now, when you're waiting for your results, can you work? Yeah, you're still a full-time student. You can wait and you can work. Now, the school has notified you that you have completed your program. At that point, you cannot work anymore, okay? Oh, what happened here? Then, the final thing is if you submit your post-grad work permit within 90 days of your program completion and the study permit is still valid, okay, then at that point, you can start working full-time. Okay. 
All right, let's go and talk about permanent residence now. Okay, so once you graduate, you could get a post-grad work permit, which Elizabeth was mentioning, and that's going to allow you to work for an employers throughout Canada. So you'll find that after you graduate, many of the programs for permanent residency do require you to do what's called high-skilled work. So it's very, very important to know whether a job that you take is high-skilled or low-skilled so that you know if it's going to qualify you for PR and keep your options open. So IRCC has categorized all the different jobs into different national occupation codes, which are also called NOC codes. The NOC codes are divided into six tiers, and tier 0, 1, 2, and 3 are considered high-skilled, whereas tier 4, 5 are considered low-skilled. And so in 2022, this whole system did change. Some jobs that were considered low-skilled are now high-skilled, like truck drivers, personal support workers, etc., Whereas some people that or some jobs that were considered high skilled are now considered low skilled. So the skill level is really important to understand. And sometimes we see students making the mistake of just relying on what your friends did or what other people on forums have done. Just um, and just know that you need to make sure that you have it right for your particular situation. And as Elizabeth mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, the laws do change and things change in immigration all the time. So you need to make sure you're, you're up to date and that your job is going to qualify you for the specific PR route that you want. We're also on this slide, there's also a list of all of the changes that happened in 2022. And these slides will be uploaded eventually. So you can take a look there and just make sure where your not code falls. Okay, so let's talk about express entry. Many of you probably already heard of express entry, but there's a lot of misconceptions about ex express entry. So I just wanted to first of all, go over a big picture of what that is, and then we'll talk about some details. So the express entry route is one of the most popular routes to go. It's not the only way to get permanent residence, one of the ways to get permanent residence. And here's how it works. First, you create an online profile. You qualify. You can create an online profile if you qualify under one of three categories, Federal Skilled Worker Class, Canadian Experience Class, or Federal Skilled Trades Class. Uh, once you create an online profile, then you can get into the Express Entry Pool, okay? And so you can, Create a profile, you can be in the express entry pool, but make no mistake, just because you are in the pool does not, does not mean that you have applied for permanent residence. That does not count as having applied. When you're in the pool, you haven't applied for anything. You have just indicated to the government that you can qualify under one of the categories and that you're interested in applying. Now, every maybe two weeks or so, the government will have a draw where they invite people who are in the pool to apply for permanent residence. And they will issue a certain number of invitations to apply. Uh, who do they issue the invitations to apply? It depends on your points. Sometimes if you have provincial nominations that are related to express entries, not all provincial nominations, just the express entry linked provincial nominations, uh, you get 600 points based on your background. And then they also now last year started category-based draws as well, based on occupations and uh, French speaking skills. So it's only after you get that invitation to apply that you are able to actually submit your application and apply, okay? So uh, let's first talk about how to get into the pool. The first category is called the Federal Skilled Worker Class. And many of you guys may already be able to get into the pool based on this class. To get into this class, you need to have at least one year of high-skilled work experience in one occupation that is continuous. That work experience does not mean that you have to have this work experience in Canada. 
It doesn't have to have work experience when you're not a full-time student. You can be self-employed. Uh, you know, it could be a lot of different kinds of work experience. After that, you need to pass your language exam, uh, have a certain and then certain amount of points based on your education, age, background, et cetera. You need to meet the minimum score based on your background points, and you need to have financial savings. This is one of the oldest uh, economic programs that we have around. Uh, I think it was started in the 80s when my father actually applied for permanent residence under this program. And it's gone through a lot of changes now, and it's but it's still part of the Express Entry program. We have a lot of people who apply under this program who have never even come to Canada before. So like I said, some of you may already qualify under this program. The second uh, stream is the Canadian Experience class. Now you also need to have work experience under this class, but it's very, very different from the first one. To qualify under this class, you need to have one year of high-skilled work experience. It doesn't have to be in one occupation, but it has to be in Canada. It, the work experience has to be when you're not a full-time student, and it has to be legal, and it has to be something where you are employed by a Canadian employer. You cannot be self-employed okay what does that mean first of all you cannot own or control the company so you can't set up your own company for example and hire yourself okay when you work for someone else you should at the end of the year get a t4 okay not a t4 a which means that you're a contractor okay a t4 so the T4 allows you, it shows that you're an employee and on your pay stubs, you would have had income tax, CPP, EI taken out. That's what being an employee means, okay? And that's very important for the work experience. So one year out of three years upon application of high-skilled, Mary talked about what high-skilled is, tier zero, one, two, and three, of work experience that is in Canada when you're employed and it can't be when you are a full-time student. Skilled trades, we're not gonna go into it too much. Not very many people qualify for this. This is for the people in the construction trades, okay? And cooks and chefs as well. All right, so let's say you got into the program. You're oh, Sorry, you got into the pool. Now, you're going to get a series of points and you're going to get a score. Now, what are what would the score be based upon? Well, here is the criteria. First of all, age. So age is something you can't change. But, you know, you might want to apply as early as possible. When you get to your 30s, your points start dropping. Minus five points, minus six points every time it's your birthday. In your 40s, it's a fast drop, minus 10, minus 11 points. By the time you're 45, the good news is you don't have to worry about age anymore. But the bad news is that you get a zero on your age compared to people in your 20s who have 100 or 110 points, okay? So apply as early as possible uh, to get those age points. Education is something where if you have two programs, at least one program has at least three years um, of, of uh, the program, and then the other program can be a post-secondary program of anything, your points will jump. So for example, if you had a bachelor's degree, you know, back home in, in your home country, then you came to Canada and you, you got another program at Sioux College, that would really make your points jump. Language. Now, right now, the points have become very, very competitive. They're very, they're higher than any ever before. Uh, normally, we're looking at around the 500 uh, range for most people. And so language points, if you guys, especially if you don't have any Canadian work experience, you really need to get 
the language points, uh, it's called CLB of nine. So basically for the IELTS, you're looking at sevens and reading, writing, and speaking at eight and listening, or in self, if you're looking at nines throughout, if not higher in order to be competitive. Relevant Canadian work experience. And this is the work experience that I was telling you about that is the same as the Canadian experience class work experience, except we count work experience in the last 10 years uh, instead of just in the last three years for Canadian work experience, experience class. Foreign work experience, if you have high skilled work experience outside of Canada, uh, that's at least one year or three years. There's two levels there in the last 10 years. That can get you some points. Uh, your spouse's education, language, Canadian work experience, if they have their super spouses and they have a lot of points, they may add some points to you. Otherwise, it may be a little bit less. Um, by the way, who's your spouse? Do you guys know who your spouse is? Uh, of course, people you're married to but also people who you're common law with. So um, common law is defined under immigration law as people who have one year, who you have lived with in a conjugal relationship for at least one year, okay? So after the one year time, if you guys are still together, then you guys are common law. And on your forms, they will always ask, what is your marital status? If you are common law, make sure you check common law. Otherwise, it would be misrepresentation, okay? For example, sometimes, you know, some someone, they're applying for a permanent residence and they don't add their partner on there. Maybe they weren't common law when they applied, but eventually when just before they get permanent residence, they become common law, it's one year. If you don't tell immigration that you have a common law partner at that time, even if you've submitted your application, you're about to get your permanent residence, that later can come back and bite you. You could be even have your permanent residence stripped because you misrepresented on your application. You would be barred from sponsoring uh, your spouse. So there's a lot of issues with not declaring common law partners when you're supposed to, okay? So just be aware of that. Provincial nominee programs. Now, um, uh, Mary will be talking about the Ontario provincial nominee programs. And you have to be aware that there are certain provincial nominee programs that are express entry linked that will give you 600 points. But there are also other provincial nominee programs that are not express entry linked. So if you get a nomination under those programs, you don't get 600 points for express entry, but that's because you don't have to go through express entry at all. You just submit your application directly with the, with the IRCC to get PR. Um, if you've studied in Canada, if you studied at Sioux College, you will get some points there. Arranged employment. Now, here is where a lot of people, they think, oh, if I have a post-grad work permit, I have a job offer, I have arranged employment, right? No, you don't. Arranged employment is a very specific situation, and it's only available to those people who have an LMIA uh, or if you have an employer-specific work permit, okay? How do you get that? That's a very much longer story and we don't have time to get into it today. However, I would encourage you guys to come for a consultation and we can talk about that. If you do have jobs, um, there are all sorts of different ways to, to do that and we can see if that's available for you. Uh, if you have brothers or sisters or Canadians or permanent residents in Canada, you get some points. And the fluency in French, you can get significant points if you're fluent in French as well. Uh, trade certification, uh, that's for the construction trades, cooks and shops as well, okay? All right, so now one more layer I'm going to add to that, and that's the new category-based draws that came into place last year. So starting from the summer of last year, the government 
it used to be that they just look at whoever is in the pool, uh, you know, depending on your points, they would they will just select the top. Okay. Now, starting last year, they had some special draws. They still do the general draws where they see like everybody in the pool you can they'll invite, but they also started having some special draws where they look at people who have very high French level proficiency or healthcare occupations, um, or if you have STEM occupations. And for this, you have to have six months of work experience in the last three years. Is it two years or three years? Uh, three years. Three years, right? Yeah. So STEM occupations, trade occupations, transport, agriculture, agri-foods, and I've included a link here. We'll send these slides out to you guys and you guys can check it out yourselves, okay? So if you are lucky enough to fall under one of these categories, you might be able to be invited to apply even if your score is a little bit lower because, you know, they say express entry is something where you're skimming the cream. You take the top, okay? But in these kind of things, they're not looking at everybody. They're only looking at a small group of people. And so if they're going to invite, for example, a thousand people in healthcare occupations, well, maybe there's only, you know, I don't know, 10,000 people in the healthcare occupations. Then just the top 1,000 of the 10,000, you know, it could be as low as 300 points or 400 points. 50 points for example and not the 500 points for a total okay so for these kind of draws they tend to have lower points if you fit in one of these categories all right over to you may okay so as elizabeth mentioned there are other ways to gain points in express entry through what are called the provincial nomination programs so they're also referred to as the p and p's and PNPs are where the, a province has made an agreement with the government to have the ability to select people that they want to get permanent residence within that specific province in accordance to what that province needs. So Ontario's provincial nominee program is called the OINP. And the OINP has different kinds of streams. So there are some streams, which I'll describe here, which are express entry linked. So if you receive a nomination through one of these express entry linked streams, it adds 600 extra points to your express entry score, which essentially ensures that you're going to be able to apply for permanent residence, usually within the next draw. So how do these express entry streams work? So in Ontario, you can't just go and apply to these express entry OINP streams. First, you actually have to be in the express entry pool. So once you're in the express entry pool and you qualify for express entry for either federal skilled worker, Canadian experience class, um, then you're waiting to receive a notification of interest from the province. So you have to be in that express entry pool and then only if Ontario's interested in you, they'll send you that notification of interest. So who are they gonna be giving those notifications of interest out to? So there are three categories that they've identified. The first is the human capital stream. So in order to qualify for this stream, you need to have a bachelor's degree. It doesn't have to be from Canada. It can be from overseas. And they also uh, specify specific things that they're interested in. So for example, uh, there are these new category-based draws that Elizabeth was mentioning. And the human capital stream has also prioritized people in similar positions in the past. So people in tech, people in healthcare, and they essentially specify types of applicants that they're going to invite. Uh, it can also be people with job offers, with certain work experience, but we don't really know beforehand what they're looking for until they do a draw. And that's why it's good to be in the express entry pool if you're looking to get a draw through this stream, um, because you don't know what Ontario might do next with this human capital stream. So the next stream with that's express entry linked is the French speaking stream. So for this one, you need to have a bachelor's degree and a high level of French uh, which is CLB level seven. And then you also need a CLB level of six in English. And if you're in the express entry pool and you show that you have those things, you could be invited through the French speaking stream. And then the third one is targeting people in the skilled trades. 
So if you're in one of these identified construction trades that they've listed, uh, and you've been working in that occupation for at least one year in Ontario within the last two years, you don't need to have a bachelor's degree or any specific education as long as you have a work permit and you've been working for one year in that skilled trade. So beyond the express entry link streams, there's also several streams through OINP that are not connected to express entry. So these ones are totally outside of express entry. You don't have to be in the pool. It's a different program. It's a different application. Uh, they have different requirements as well. So with these non-express entry streams, the process of applying is a little bit different. You're making an online profile to register what's called your expression of interest. Anyone who's uh, qualified goes for the pro, pardon me. So you put yourself into the OINP pool for the specific stream that you're qualified for. Then if Ontario is interested in you, they'll do some, they do draws through the, uh, the expression of interest streams as well. And you can get an, what's called a notification of interest. So Ontario does these OINP draws, but they don't announce them beforehand. So it's best to get in the pool as soon as possible. If you do qualify for one of these streams, because you never know when Ontario will do another draw. If you get selected, they issue you a letter called a notification of interest, and then you apply to get your nomination certificate. And once that goes through, you then apply for PR. So where express entry is a two-step process, the OIMP expression of interest is more of a three-step process. And the streams themselves are totally different. So they give you different points in express entry and different factors are scored. Some streams require you to have a job offer, which I'll get into in a moment. And then there are some other streams like the master and PhD streams that don't require job offers. Uh, for those streams, you do need to apply within two years of completing. So for example, if you say you have a spouse who's studying here in Canada, maybe they're doing a master's or a PhD, make sure that if they qualify for this program, they do, they do apply for it within two years of graduating. And then finally, there are the job offer employer-based OINP streams. So these are not express entry streams. They're in that expression of interest category that I mentioned. Um, for all of these streams, you need to have a business that's supporting your application. And that business needs to meet a few requirements. So they need to have been in business for three years. If they're inside the GTA, the greater Toronto area, they have to show that their gross income in the last fiscal year was $1 and that they have five full-time Canadian or permanent resident employees. If they're outside of the GTA, those requirements are a little bit lower, so they have to have 500000 in income in the last fiscal year, and they only need to have three full-time Canadian or PR employees. The job offer itself has to be full-time and permanent, and permanent means no end date on your contract. It can't be seasonal work. It can't just be for a little while. It has to be a full-time permanent job. Within these employer-based categories, there are a few different streams. So there's the international student stream. The international student stream is for people who have completed their program of study in Ontario, such as people from Sioux College, um, who, and they also need to apply within two years of graduation and have applied from an eligible program. So that means you've either done a two-year program or you've done a one-year um, postgraduate program from an eligible school. Um, so when you look, uh, pardon me, so for the international student stream, you need uh, a high skill job offer from a qualifying employer. You need to be paid at least the low wage rate for your occupation, according to your location of employment. So you need to see what the low wage is for the region that you're located in and make sure that your job offer meets that requirement. The next one is the skilled worker stream. So in order to qualify for this stream, you need to have at least two years of work experience out of the last five years in the same occupation as your job offer. The work experience doesn't have to be in Canada. It doesn't have to be in Ontario. It just has to be able to show that you do have two years of experience out of the last five years. It has to be high skilled. You have to be offered the median wage for your location. And this stream doesn't have any education requirements. Uh, you don't have to have a specific education background for the stream. You just need that qualifying job offer and the work experience. And then finally, there's the in-demand job offers, uh, the in-demand jobs. So the OINP has a list of occupations that qualify for this stream. It's not just every occupation. It's actually a specific list on the website. 
and it's one of the only ones that includes low-skilled job offers and positions. So if you, for example, or your spouse is in a low-skilled position, that could potentially qualify. You need an employer who meets those requirements above, and you need at least nine months of experience in Ontario in that same occupation, but it can be with a different employer. Uh, the salary that you need to make for this stream is also the median level wage for that occupation. So, you know, as um, students at Sault Ste. Marie, from an immigration perspective, you have made an excellent choice. In fact, I recommend a lot of my clients who come to me and ask me which school should they attend. I refer a lot of them to Sault Ste. Marie because of the immigration advantages. Let's look at the immigration advantages. First of all, you guys are not going to Quebec. Check number one, because if you go to Quebec, you have to speak French in order to immigrate. So number one, you're, you're much better off. Number two, when you go to Ontario, you're in a Northern community. That right away, you will get more points for the OIMP, International Student Stream, Federal Skilled Workers Stream, uh, sorry, not Federal, the Skilled Worker Stream, all of those things, you will get much more uh, points because you're studying in a Northern Ontario uh, college. Now, the third thing that really gives you an advantage is you're going, you're studying in a community that participates in the RNIP program, okay? So how do you get permanent residence? You can apply for permanent residence through this program. First of all, you need to be recommended from the community, okay? And you need to qualify. So you need to have a uh, either one year of qualifying work experience or if you graduated from a two-year program in Sault Ste. Uh, Marie, okay? So it can't be in the other, uh, it has to be in the Sault Ste. Marie campus where you've studied for at least 18 months, okay? Uh, then you don't need the work experience. And you do need to have that job offer and the, the community really looks at what kind of job offer do you have from within Sault Ste. Marie, okay? Then uh, your language benchmarks, you should be fine if you, you know, done your, if you got into Sault Ste. Marie to study, you should be fine to, with your language. You can work in Canada or have settlement funds. That's about it. So the main thing is you have studied or you have the qualifying work experience you've studied in a two-year program in Sault Ste. Marie and you have this qualifying job offer in the community where you would get recommended by the community. Okay, and another option for PR is the caregiver stream. So this is a program that the government has set up, which allows you to apply for PR if you can show that you have cared for either children or an elderly or special needs person in their home. So the work that you have to do has to be that you're hired to work in an individual's home. It can't be in a hospital or a nursing home. It has to be in a private residence. Um, if you work for 12 months and you can get a language score above CLB5, then you can submit an application through this stream. The important thing to note about this stream is that the government only accepts a limited number of these applications each year. And once they reach their limit, they close the applications until the next year. So the program for caring for children is extremely competitive and the, the cap on the program is usually reached within minutes of it opening every year. Whereas the program for caring for elderly people often takes a bit longer to fill up, which may make it more strategic to decide to get work in that um, field. So if you're planning on applying to this program, just make sure you're thinking through your timing for applying and how long you have work permit validity for. And also keep in mind, this program is a great option to think about if your spouse has the education that they require and can work here in Canada. So they could start working for an elderly person in their home, for example, and then potentially qualify through this stream after a year of work. Yeah, this program I think is is um, is underutilized, I think by a lot of international students. Because a lot of people 
you know, you you will already have your open work permits or your spouses will already have open work permits. So you can just go and work right away for someone to take care of someone in their in their home. Like Mary said, just be aware, you can't be hired through an agency, okay? You have to be hired directly by the people or their families, okay, in to 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 take care of them in their home. But after you work for one year, you will qualify for permanent residence through this category. All right, now we have talked a lot, a lot about different things. We just wanted to give you guys some pieces of practical advice to take back with you. So the first piece of advice is to have a plan as to what you need to do to get to your immigration goals. Not only a short-term plan, but also a long-term plan. If you're planning on getting PR eventually, make sure that you're on the right track now. Now, once you have your plan ready to go and you come for a consultation, uh, then it's time that you need to do it, right? Just do it, okay? Now, that might be a lot easier than said than done. Uh, there are maybe things that you need to, you know, you need to study, take your exams for IELTS or CELPIP. Uh, maybe you might need to do another program in order to get a longer time on your work permit. A lot of these things are not easy choices to make, um, but it starts with the beginning to know what choices you have to make um, and then and then deciding whether or not you want to do that. Another tip is to make sure that you stay in status and that you don't misrepresent. So keep a close eye on those expiry dates on your study permit and always tell the truth to immigration when you're making an application. Lying or providing incorrect information on an application can result in a five-year ban from Canada. Finally, if your application, hopefully you, your application is not rejected, you started working with a good lawyer from the very beginning. But if your application is rejected, do not wait to contact a lawyer, okay? So for example, you know, um, sometimes people come to me after they've called the call center and the call center said, oh, okay, don't worry. Uh, we'll help you. I'll write a note in your file and, you know, you trust them. And, and then afterwards, your application, there's nothing happens or your application is rejected. By the time you come to me, we have long past any sort of uh, deadline for federal court or, um, you know, because you the, the call center would have put in a note that's counted as reconsideration. So there's no way for me to then help you do another actual reconsideration where we put in actual documentation and legal submissions because IRCC only considers one reconsideration uh, for each application, right? There's also a lot of issues with timelines with restoration of status or your timeline to apply for a postgrad work permit, uh, et cetera, okay? So please don't try to fix things yourself go and seek the consultation from a qualified lawyer who knows what they're doing. Uh, if you wanted to contact us, I'll put the uh, information on here. Um, contact us and we will set up a consult to go over your situation. We do always offer Sioux College uh, students a discount for the consultation fee, it's $100. And we'll have a call using Zoom. We'll go over your options and then uh, at least you have a plan as to what you need to do, okay? All right, let's get going on the questions. What, okay. So if you guys have questions, we have three questions right now. If you have more questions, put them in the Q&A box, in the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen, click on that and you can enter your questions. Okay. All right. So the first question that we have is, can we apply, uh, apply to express entry when on a study permit? Uh, yes, you can. Um, many people qualify to get into the pool, especially under the federal skilled worker class. Uh, the question is not just whether you can get into the pool, though. It's whether you can get out of the pool and whether you will get an invitation to apply. 
So um, do seek do seek the advice to see what your chances are um, through express entry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can international students in study work permits uh, can apply for PR after having 12 months of work experience, or do they need to be transferred to postgrad work permit to apply? I think what this person means is they would have had 12 months of work experience while they're a student, because right now, until the end of April, you can work full time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is, is you won't get the work experience points that you need for Canadian work experience under express entry. So um, for express entry, that could you could be losing significant points. And most people, not everybody, but most people may not have enough points without those Canadian experience points, um, work experience points added to there. Because those points that you get while you're working, while you're a student, those aren't counted as Canadian work experience, okay? There may be other, though, there may be a lot of other programs that could qualify, okay? Caregiver program, for example, or um, some OIMP, if you have job offers, et cetera. So come for a consultation and we will, look and see what you need to do and what you could qualify. Yeah, they, they followed up saying that that's, they were referring to the, the caregiver. Okay. Yeah. So I believe with the caregiver, I don't think there is an issue with the caregiver program. Right, Mary? Yeah, you just have to have completed the study. So if you're relying on the studies, you're going to need that diploma in order to qualify. Mm -hmm. So, right. So you need to have one year post-secondary program. But if you have that and you're you're working, you've been working with someone, then that's that's fine. Okay, um, this one's pretty specific about somebody's individual situation regarding their passport expiry. So, so someone's pass passport expires earlier. Um, the, it'll expire before they can get the full post grad work permit. So if your passport is going to expire earlier than the three years, for example, you're entitled to three years because you did a two-year program, but your passport expires before the three years, the best thing you could do is to get a new passport that doesn't expire if you can so that you can get the full three years because the work permit can only be issued to the expiry date of the passport. But if you cannot, then what would happen is you can file for an extension of that post-grad work permit for the full three years um, once you get a new passport, okay? So once your post-grad work permit is about to expire and you have a new uh, passport, you can file to extend that work permit for the full three years of the work permit. That's one exception to you can only get one post-grad work permit because you're actually entitled to the three years. Great. How many maximum hours can we actually work part-time till April? Well, if you're entitled to work full-time, and that's those people who had a work permit before... I believe December 7th. December 20th. 7th, right? Sorry, if you had a study permit before December 7th, you can work full-time and there's no limit to the amount of hours that you want to work off campus until the end of April. Great. Um, I don't have an employment condition on my work permit. Airport officers missed that to include that specific condition. I got my SIN number because I have a co-op. Can I work part-time legally without having that condition in my study permit? Yeah, you can work uh, legally on your study permit. Um, you know, that's a, that's a, that's allowed. If you, you know, you have your study permit, you can work legally. Just the social insurance numbers can be a pain if, if, um, uh, it's stated that you're not authorized to work, et cetera, on your study permit. But legally speaking, yes, you can work uh, if you have a study permit. Okay. My wife has an open work permit. She's in IT with seven years of experience. Which category would shall she shall be filing PR application? She's actively looking for offers in Canada. Well, that's a good question. I can't really answer that until we come and, and we have come for a consultation together with your wife. And we'll take a look. Um, IT has a lot of good programs. And, uh, you know, we can certainly take a look and see what she would qualify for. How uh, 
maybe how can my spouse get a caregiver job in person? Can they work caregiving job if they're from a different background too? Like they're from a management stream, not from medical. Yeah. So the, the nice thing about the caregiver program is they don't specify what kind of post-secondary program education you need. So if you have an MBA, but then, you know, you're, you're taking care of someone, you're doing the work, you can still qualify for the caregiver program. Okay. Uh, so especially those people who have the open work permits, because, you know, if you're overseas, then you would apply for a work permit based on the caregiver program. In those cases, the officers do assess whether or not you're able to do the job as a caregiver with a work permit. But on the permanent residence, if you already have an open work permit and you've already done the job for, for a year, then you're, you still qualify even if the degree wasn't in caregiving, for example. Great. If my spouse gets a job as a personal support worker, after how many months of work can she apply for, he apply for PR and on what stream can he apply? Okay, so that's a good question. We can't say right away because we don't know what program he could qualify. We have to ha you have to come for a consultation. Certain personal support workers are now high skilled uh, workers. Certain personal support workers, if you're, for example, hired by someone in their home, that's still considered low skilled. So we, we have to take a look at the entirety and not just him, we have to take a look at you as well together as a, as a family unit, we have to take a look at your, your options. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I take a break or go to my home country in between continuing the course for any kind of emergency? So if you wanted to take a break, ask the school for authorized leave. Okay. Don't just go and take a break just, just like that. Ask the school for authorized leave. That will make your life a lot easier in order to, to get the postgrad work permit afterwards. Mm -hmm. Can a Canadian driving license add points for your PR? Oh, I wish. No, <laughs> unfortunately, no. What about applying for PR when we are in Sioux College, Brampton campus? So if you're in the Brampton campus, you want to qualify for certain things like the RNIP program um, and your points, for example, for the OIMP, uh, maybe a little lower, but that doesn't mean that you couldn't qualify for other programs. So do come and have a consultation with us and we can look at solutions for you. Great. Uh, next one, study permit before the 7th, as in you should be in the country before the 7th or get the visa for study before the 7th. I think that's about the working authorization. Oh, working. Good question. Mary, do you know what that... Here, let me find the exact rules for it. Okay, so what... yeah. applicants who have already submitted an application for a study permit as of December 7th will be able to work off campus for more than 20 hours a week until April 30th, 2024. So if you've already submitted which means, of course, if you have the visa you would have submitted, then you're good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is work experience mandatory for post-grad work permit? And how many days before we graduate can we start processing for post-grad work permit? No, work experience is not mandatory for post-grad work. What's mandatory for post-grad work permit is that you have studied as a full-time student in the qualifying program. Okay, so as long as you've studied in the program, you've graduated, uh, then you can apply. Uh, you cannot apply before you finish your program. Not convocation. Convocation doesn't mean anything. When you finish your program, then you can apply. Okay? And it starts how many days? 90 days from the date that you finish the program. That you should apply so that you can start working as soon as you apply. And also when your study permit is still valid. Okay? If you guys came here late, we will be sending you a recording of the program uh, and then you, you can uh, go through it as well, okay? Okay, can I apply for PR alone even if my spouse is here with me in Canada? You may be able to apply by yourself, but you know, it, a certain, in certain cases it might be okay, but most of the time I advise people to apply as a family. It's the the amount of hassle um, to have to apply 
by yourself and then sponsor someone afterwards is often not worth it. Um, also, if you were to apply by yourself, you still have to declare your spouse, even if you're applying on your own without accompanying spouse. Okay, so we'll have to discuss that. Come for a consultation and we'll discuss those options. How to apply for visa extension and what are the requirements? My uh, letter of acceptance was January 2023. My study permit's expiring in March 15th, 2024. My program started on January 8th and it goes until August 2024. Okay, so a visa is different from a study permit. A visa is something that allows you to travel. It's on your, that sticker that's on the, the passport that allows you to travel inside Canada. What you're talking about, I think, is a study permit extension. So you can file a study permit extension online and, uh, you know, so that you can continue to study until you finish your program. Normally, the study permit should be issued 90 days a valid for 90 days, at least 90 days after you've completed your program to allow you to have some time to apply for the postgraduate work permit. Okay. Under what category uh, is dental assistant? Is it federal skilled worker? What are the PR chances? Dental assistant is an occupation. There's no category for that, but uh, we can take a look at your chances of qualifying for permanent residence uh, for, for different kind of categories. My spouse's work permit as an as employer open employment location specified Brampton occupation open, which has been limiting location for job. What so is this the person <laughs> seems okay. to have an a spouse has an open work permit, but the officer made a mistake and limited the employment to Brampton. So what you may want to do is file a amendment to the work permit to allow your spouse to work elsewhere as well. Okay. What if I get married between my two-year course? What are my wife's PR options? Again, uh, let's come for a consultation and we can go over the options. Here's another one. Uh, my husband is an open work permit. He's 47. Is he still eligible for PR? He's in the construction industry, but has no experience yet in Canada. Probably, you know, construction right now, there's a there's a lot of uh, advantages to working in the construction industry. If your husband has an open work permit, he works in there, there are options. Come for a consultation and we'll tell you, we'll go over different kinds of options for your family. I want to have a consultation. How can I book my appointment? Uh, very simple. Email us, inquiries at lmlawgroup.com. Tell us that you're coming from Sioux College. And we will give you, we'll book you in uh, for a consultation uh, and it'll be, um, it, it'll be the discounted student rate of $100 plus tax. Okay. I'm a registered nurse in Ontario, just started my program. Some companies offered me a job in different provinces. Can I accept the job and switch to a work permit from a student permit? So you can qualify, if you qualify, if you graduate, you can qualify for a post-grad work permit. If you don't graduate, you would have to qualify for a work permit in other ways. So for example, if there was an LMIA that they applied for, or maybe an AIP or different kinds of ways, but you have to qualify. You can't just apply just because you want to. You have to qualify for another work permit. Mm -hmm. Okay, this one's continued from the, the working question. A uh, college counselor said, without having employment condition on my study permit, I can't work even though I have a SIN. It can create problems while applying for postgrad work permit. I'm confused now that you said I can work without having that condition on my study permit. Yeah, I I really need to see your study permit. Come for a consultation and we'll go over it with you, okay? If my wife is an Ayurvedic doctor back in India, but Ayurveda is not recognized here, still can she be eligible for PR or caregiver route? Just uh, again, these are these are very specific questions about your own case. We don't we can't tell you just from the little things that you're telling us. Normally, you come in for a consultation for around half an hour to an hour, where we go over your situation, and then we can advise you on what what route to take. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, medical trans. What about as medical trans? <laughs> come for what? a consult. Come for a consult.
I had my visa since September 2023, but I arrived January 24. Can I work full time? If you, uh, yes, if you have applied for your study permit, then by December, then you can work full time. Great. Okay. Okay. That's it. We did it. All right, guys. Oh, did we get one more question? No. Okay. All right. Take care. Thank you so much for your time, Elizabeth and Mary. We really appreciate it. Thank you. It's it's our pleasure. Thanks so much, Heather. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye.